You're listening to the First Baptist Rockdale Sunday Sermons Podcast. First Baptist Rockdale is a church dedicated to making disciples who make disciples. We hope you enjoy this week's message. We're continuing our quest through the end of the book of Genesis. We're in Genesis 48 today. If you have your Bible, you can flip there. And uh, we're looking at the end of uh, the Joseph narrative, the end of Jacob's life, Joseph's father. As they've all moved down to Egypt, the whole family has gone down to Egypt. That's kind of where the story takes place. And the question that, that this, this passage deals with is, uh, what does a mature, faithful person look like? You know, the book of James tells us that we're supposed to be mature in our faith. But it says, you know, you know there's, you're going to face many trials, be joyful when you face trials of any kind, because you know that the trials will uh, create perseverance, and the perseverance will ultimately create this sort of character in you, and this character ultimately, when fully conformed, will make you perfect, complete, mature in Christ. Right? And so one of the goals of the Christian is to be mature in our faith, not to live as an immature Christian for our entire life, but to grow into maturity. So the question is, how do I know when I've achieved mature faith? When, when can, what are some markers in my life that I can look at and say, hey, I'm a little more mature than I was yesterday, right? And, and there's all sorts of things that you can look at, but there's a couple that Jacob, the patriarch, shows us in Genesis chapter 48 as he approaches the end of his life. Chapter, or chapter 48, starting in verse 1, this is what uh, Genesis says. It says, after this, Joseph was told, Behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and it was told to Jacob, Your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength, and he sat up in bed, and Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and he blessed me. And he said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make you a company of peoples, and I will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt, before I came to you in the land of Egypt, Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are, and the children that you father after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of their brothers, of their brothers in their inheritance. As for me... When I came from Padan to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan on the way when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. All right, so what's going on right now? Jacob is dying. He's at the end of his life. And he's doing something that's really, really significant, but kind of lost because we're not like early peoples of the Old Testament. We're like, I don't know, why is he claiming Joseph's two kids as his kids? Well, what is going on? Why is he like an adoption, a forced adoption that he's doing? What what exactly is going on in in this story? What's going on in this story is something that mirrors something that happened in Jacob's life many, many years ago. And it's it's the concept of the birthright. If you remember Jacob and Esau, the very first story that's noteworthy in Jacob and Esau's life is that uh, Jacob is out making food with his mama, because he was kind of a mama's boy, and Esau was out in the woods hunting and doing all the stuff that he does, like manly stuff. And Esau comes in from hunting, and he is absolutely famished. He, he needs food, and Jacob's just cooking, because that's what he does. He's just cooking some food. He's got some stew going on the thing there. And, uh, and Esau says, hey, can I have some of that stew? And Jacob says, well, of course you can have some of that stew if you'll give me your birthright, right? And Esau, being an impulsive man who was hungry at the time and not making the best of decisions, says, what good is my birthright if I die of hunger? Sure, you can have it. Just give me the stew. And what he did there was he sold his birthright for for a cup of stew to Jacob. And what the birthright was, was it was the, the, the right of privilege that the oldest child had. And then when inheritance was given out in, the, in this world at this time, the oldest child would get two pieces of the pie. And so if you have five kids 
Instead of dividing the pie into five pieces, you would cut it into six pieces, and the oldest child would get two of those pieces. If you had 50 kids, I don't know why, but if you did have 50 kids, you'd cut the pie into 51 pieces, and the oldest child would get two of those pieces. And if you had two kids, which is what uh, Isaac had, Jacob and Esau's father, the pie would be divided into three pieces, and Esau was supposed to get 66% of all that Isaac was to possess, and Jacob was supposed to get a third. It was a massive haul. What's happening here, though, is Joseph is receiving the birthright from Jacob. Jacob takes the two sons of Joseph and says, Joseph, your name is not going to be listed among the tribes of Israel, of of mine, but these two children of yours will now receive, each of them will receive a full share of my inheritance. And so, Joseph, if you were to go to the back of your Bible, and you were to look at the maps by the Moody Bible Institute, that your, your Bible, if it's, a, if it's a good Bible, it's got maps in the back, right? I they all got them in there. I'm going to look at my Bible and make sure I'm not lying to you. looks a lot like this, right? Zoom in. Um, no, <laughs> right? And it says the 12 tribes of Israel. And you'll see places like Zebulun and Gad and Judah and Benjamin and Reuben and Simeon and Naphtali. And then you'll see Ephraim and Manasseh as well. These two children of Joseph. Joseph doesn't have a spot. There. The other child of uh, Jacob that doesn't have a spot is Levi. You may notice that. There's a reason for that. It's because Levi had cities in every single one of those towns. Because Levi was supposed to be the religious leader. Uh, that family was supposed to be in charge of providing religious access. And so they had towns in every place. So there would be someone in the state, in the nation, that would be a religious leader. So Levi didn't have... Uh, like full land, it's got cities in everyone's land, okay? Um, But Joseph isn't mentioned there, but his two sons are. So Joseph receives a double portion of the inheritance. And you say, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. Joseph gets a double portion, Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh and Ephraim are the two who receive that. And any of Joseph's kids afterwards, like child one, now you're, you're, you're a part of Ephraim. Child two, you're part of Manasseh. So they have an inheritance to go back to. But where the faith comes in, we're talking about mature faith, Mature faith recognizes that there are some promises that God has given that you will not possess on this side of eternity, and you still walk in faith towards those ends. Jacob is dying. Jacob is at the very end of his life. Right before this, at the end of chapter 47, he makes Joseph promise to bring his bones back from Egypt back to the promised land. Joseph's family, or Jacob's family, is totally in Egypt. There is no remnant back in Canaan. But Jacob knew that God, who appeared to him at Luz and made a promise that he'd be a a great nation with a multitude of people, that there would be a land associated with that, and he knew that his family would go back to that land one day. And while Jacob would never set his eyes again on Canaan, He lived in the knowledge that that was a sure promise of God. And while he would never receive it, he was giving inheritance based on that. He's like, your children are going to receive this promise of land. And Joseph could have been like, but daddy, we don't have any land. We're, We're strangers in Goshen. We're just hanging out up here in the Nile Delta right now. We don't have any land. We vacated where we are. And guess what? When you vacate land... People take it, right? Yeah, yeah, new squatters moving in, and every year people start to expand their boundaries and take over, right? And so the people who were already still hanging out in Canaan, that was their land. As soon as Jacob and his family left, that land went back to the the people who had tried to have it before. But Jacob knew that God had made a promise. And his faith was mature enough to know that even though he may not receive that promise... Uh, right, he may never set eyes, he, he was certain, he was never going to set eyes again on that land. He's promising that as, a, as an inheritance because he knew in his heart that God was a promise-keeping God. I talked a lot about that last week, but guys, that is a mark of a mature faith. Some of you are getting advanced in years. Right? Some of you are, are beginning to reach whatever the end of your race is going to be. I, I don't know when it's going to be. I pray that you have... Uh, many, many good years in front of you, but some of you, like, you're going to, to meet your Savior soon. You're, you're going to come face to face with the one who saved you. 
right? And, and, and a mature person in the faith recognizes, like, we're longing for the second coming of Jesus. I'm waiting on the return of Jesus. I pray he comes in my lifetime, right? That's my prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, come. But a mature person in the faith knows that even if he doesn't come now, even if I am not part of those who are caught up in the air with the Lord, even if I don't get to witness the dead being raised in Christ, even if I'm one of the dead who have to be raised in Christ, I will hold to the promise that he's coming back. Right, And you go to the, to the very end of your days looking forward to the promise that God will one day do what he said. Right, And this even if I don't concept of faith is a mark of a mature faith. Right, uh, you see this in um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel. They're about to be thrown into the fiery furnace right, because they aren't bowing down to Nebuchadnezzar's uh, statue. The image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up commanded all of the people to bow down to. They refused to bow down, and so they were drug up front, uh, and they heated the furnace up, and they said, look, if you don't bow, you're going in the furnace. And they responded. They said, look, our God is able to save us from the fire. Like, our God is able to save us from that fire. Your fire can't harm us if our God wants us to be safe. But then they say this, they say, and even if he doesn't, save us. We won't bow down to you. Right? It's a mark of mature faith to say, look, even if I don't get on this side of eternity the thing that I want, the thing that I, I, I hope to have, even if it ends in tragedy here, I'm faithful to the God who bought me. As Christians, we live in that even if faith. We say, look, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter what, what may or may not come. We trust in God's plan. We trust that God has a plan. We cling to God's plan. And maybe we won't receive it on this side of the veil. Maybe you're going to have to cross over. Maybe you're going to go in the way of your fathers and mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers before you. But even if you do, you will remain faithful to that God. That's the faith that Jacob had. This is a huge deal because Jacob lived a fairly, like, well, I wouldn't say faithless. He struggled with his faith his whole life. But at the end of his life, God had matured him to the point that he was able to look at it and say, look, one day we're going home. And I'm never going to go there. But I'm going to give you guys inheritance based on something that I know God will give back to my family because he said it was ours. What, a, what an amazing, amazing act of faith that is. So we're like, okay, that's awesome. What, what's next? So what's next? We pick up in verse Eight. And so when Israel, that's Jacob, saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who's, who are these? And Joseph said to his father, these are my sons whom God has given me here. And he said, bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he couldn't see. So Joseph brought them near to him and he kissed them and he embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your offspring also. And Joseph removed them from his knees and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in the right hand toward Israel's left hand and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand. And he brought them near to him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger. And he put his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph, and he said, The God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, walked, the God who has been sh my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. And in them... Let my name be carried on in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father had put his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head over to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not this way, my father, since this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and he said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also will be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he. 
and his offering shall be a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, by you, uh, by you Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you rather than to your brothers one of the mountain slopes that I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and my bow. So what's happening in this section? After the adoption has taken place, after the, uh, the two sons of Joseph were now reckoned as children of Jacob, Jacob gives them the blessing. This is the other major story in Jacob's early life. Right, You have two big stories of young Jacob. One, stealing the birthright with a cup of stew. Two, dressing up in disguise like Esau and sneaking in and deceiving his nearly blind father into giving him the blessing that he desired to give to Esau. And so this is that same idea. There was this idea that a father could give a blessing to a child and that blessing, well, well like not magic, right, would bestow some sort of like this is the way God deems things to be. It's kind of a teaching to be understood for the family from then on. And so Jacob is having the same experience done to him. His eyes are now dim. He can't see. Joseph brings his, his sons and he positions them the way he wants it to be. Right? The right hand is the hand of power throughout all of Scripture. And so he puts Manasseh, his oldest son, on the right side where the right hand would fall when Jacob does the blessing. He puts Ephraim, the younger son, on the left-hand side, so he'll receive that blessing. But But Jacob crosses his hands, and Joseph says, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Joseph, a younger brother himself, you think he would understand by now that God's ways are not man's ways. But man, we all sometimes think that God's ways are man's ways. Right, God has a plan and a purpose, and it is so counterintuitive to nature. Like nature tells us the oldest will be the strongest. The oldest is where, where the power is. That is where we should go. But consistently throughout Scripture, God passes over the oldest to go to the youngest. And it's not necessarily because the youngest is special or prized. Like I'm a youngest child, so I'm like, well, obviously that's what God did, right? Like he prefers me, right? Take that, Jason and Lewis. Right? Like, like, like it's not that the youngest is, 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 is some special privileged thing, but God is teaching us by the way in which he does that, that his ways are different than man's ways. Right? He's different than man's ways. For, for, for months, uh, uh, Doc Sheffield taught, or for years, Doc Sheffield taught our junior high Sunday school class, but for months he was going through the Beatitudes with them. And I would talk to him about that, and he said, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive what God does, right? Blessed are the weak, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Blessed are those who mourn, right? The ones who are blessed are the exact opposite of the ones who should be blessed, who we think are blessed. Those who are celebrating and living in joy think, oh, they're blessed, right? Jesus himself says, right, that that if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, become a servant, Right? Which is the total inversion of the entire power structure of the world. God's ways are not our ways. And it took Jacob to the end of his life to realize this. And when he crossed his hands and offered that blessing, it was him basically saying, I get it now, God. You're different than me. The way you do things differently. And then in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, where we get this listing of people, by faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Samson did this. By faith, Jacob is listed in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. I think it's verse 21. You can look it up on your own time or while I'm talking if you get bored, okay? Um, But the the one thing that is listed as, as Jacob's great act of faith was this. It's by faith, right? He, he, He brought in Joseph's sons and gave them the blessing. Right? That was his one act of faith. That wasn't him wrestling with God in the wilderness. It wasn't him leaving Canaan to come to Egypt to take his family, to preserve his family. Right? It wasn't well, any of his escapades as a young man. Right? By faith, the one act of faith that stands above all the rest is him saying, I see that God's ways are not mine. Guys, mature faith recognizes that God does things differently than sometimes we want. Mature faith also recognizes 
that we have to submit to God's will even when we don't want to. I'll tell you, it's, it's hard. Because we plan and we prepare and we, and we organize our lives. And if you're really thoughtful, like when you were like 17, 18, 19, 20, somewhere in your young years, you said, this is how I'm going to work my life. And this is the plan that I'm going to try to follow. And you may have done really good at sticking to that plan. I'm going to go to school or I'm going to, I'm going to get a job. I'm going to join the military. I'm going to, and you have your path that you drew out. And so I'm going to walk this path because at the end of this path is financial security, uh, a family, if that matters to you, the happiness that comes uh, from a family. You're going to live in the place that you want to be. Right, whether that's in Milam County or somewhere else, right? He said, I'm going to live in the place that I want to be, on the sort of land that I want to live on. I want to take the, va- the vacation I want to take. And so you draw your whole plan out. And God looks at your plan and says, yeah, let's just cross our hands. And we realize that, that, that no matter how hard we try, we're fighting against what God is trying to do. And, and there's this like sense of, dissatisfaction and some of us like like some of you men you just swallowed it down you said to heck with it i'm just going to swallow it i'm going to work 20 more years for alcoa and i'm going to retire and god was fighting you the whole time saying stop it he said i'm just going to do it i'm going to swallow it and i'm going to do it right because that's what we were told to do by all of our forever right we were told that's what we do like if, if you got to do this thing it's the only path that you know so we just swallowed it down and we walked this path even though God was chastening us the whole way through. Right? Even though like, there was a mess being formed around us the whole way through, we said, well, this is what I've got to do. I've got to walk this path. It's the only path I know. And God's like, look, my way is not your way. It's okay. And then like, to submit to that is very hard. Because it's basically to acknowledge that all of your human wisdom doesn't matter right and that your your greatest thoughts and the greatest thoughts of those people who love you and care for you doesn't matter outside of the will for that god has for your life my my dad uh, i love my dad dad if you watch this i love you um but i remember when i was getting married i got married at 19 years old that is a ridiculous thing to do 19 i was in love 23 years ago today, I got married, by the way. 23 years, that's a huge time, yeah. Yeah, good job, me. Guys, it is, it's been super easy for me, my dear wife, though. Oh, Lord, she has been through it. Yeah, thank you. 23 years ago, I got married. But I remember my dad, when I told him, uh, I kinda, it was like a Sunday morning in October. Uh, I went to church, and I told my dad, I grabbed him before church. My parents kind of sitting on a pew, and I was like, hey, it was chairs. I said, hey. In case anyone asks, I'm engaged. And then I just walked away. <laughs> like, that's how my parents found out uh, that I got engaged. Because I was like, we were at church. She had a ring. Someone's going to notice. And someone's going to ask my parents. And I don't want them to not be like, no, no, no. We would know. They wouldn't know. So I wanted to make sure that they weren't blindsided by anyone else. So I felt like I did, did them a solid. But after that, my dad kind of pulled me aside. And he gave me this, this piece. But I said, look, like, son, I got married. I got married young. And, and it's hard. It didn't work, and, and he kind of went through the thing. And he was trying to give me, like, his, his real experience. It's like, you're 19, you don't know what you want. I'm, you, when you're 19, you have no idea what you want, right? I got a soon-to-be 18-year-old daughter. She's going to get a, a tattoo. That's her, 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 her desire right now to go to get a tattoo, right? Whatever. She doesn't know what she wants. Like, one day she's going to look down at it and be like, what did I do? God bless her for that. You're back there hiding on the ground, right, daughter? Oh, you're over there. Hey, good to see you, sweetie. <laughs> right? Like, she doesn't know what she wants. She'll find out one day. And, and assuming she doesn't wreck everything along the way, like, that's fine. Like, she'll figure it out. Like, whatever. People make choices. And 19, I didn't know what I, I... I knew I loved that woman, Danielle. I said, I'm going to marry this woman. And so my dad told me, like, he kind of gave me his wisdom. And I was just like, yeah, I really feel like this is what God wants me to do. I still do, 23 years later. Like, still feel deep in my heart that's exactly what God was wanting me to do. Ridiculous as it is to get married at 19 years old. I do not prescribe that for my 19-year-olds in the room here. It's a ridiculous thing to do. Like, just, but it's what God wanted me to do. Likewise, my dad pulled me aside when he found out what I was majoring in in college. It's majoring in Christianity and psychology. That is not a profitable venture. 
He said, son, why don't you get one degree, because I was a double major. He said, why don't you, you can get your Christianity major, because you know you want to do ministry. Why don't you get one degree that has some value in it, though? Something that you can do something with if this Christianity thing doesn't work out. Like, not, not that faith, but like your, your serving and ministry thing doesn't work out. And said, Dad, this is what I'm going to do. Like, I was fully committed, but I was arrogant in 18. It's like, this is what I'm going to do my whole life, Dad. I know what I'm going to do, 18. And my dad, who has wisdom for years above that, he's like, he just, he said this to me. I remember it clear as day. He said, son, I know a lot of unemployed ministers. And in my 18-year-old arrogance, I looked at my dad and I said, yeah, but you know a lot more unemployed software engineers, don't you? Because that's what he did. <laughs> right? Like, 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 people don't have jobs all over the place, Dad. This is what God wants me to do. Was my dad wrong for giving me worldly wisdom? No. Absolutely good for him to do. But in those seasons, God's hands were crossed. So I just, just walked the path. And I'm not saying I've always done the right thing, because, guys, I've, I've often sought after worldly wisdom and ran down the worldly wisdom path thinking that I know best, that I can plan, that my events, my concepts, my mind is good enough. And then sometimes God's like, well, it's not working. Shocking, because I'm not there. We have to be willing to recognize, mature faith is able to recognize that God's ways are not our ways. And in those times when God is chastening you, when, it, when you're living in some sense of rebuke for the life that you're walking in because of your own worldly mindset, like your own worldly wisdom and you're walking that path, if you're living underneath this sort of idea that God is, that you're missing it, to stop and to be willing to reorient your life even at great personal cost to yourself. I don't want you to be careless. I don't want all of y'all to get unemployed tomorrow and the church to be funding all of your bills. I really don't. But some of you in here probably are doing the exact wrong thing with your life right now. I mean the exact wrong thing. And God has told you, and he has shown you, and you are kicking against him every chance that you get. And your family is paying the consequences for it. The only thing that's not paying the consequences for your rebellion to God is your bank account is going up. Guys, that is not okay. If you're here today, you're living in rebellion, guys, I want you to know it's a good time to recognize that God's ways are not yours. Sometimes his hands are crossed to seek where the blessing is. For the rest of time, Manasseh was the older child of Joseph. For the rest of time, when you see Ephraim and Manasseh listed, it's Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh. Right? Because God had chosen to bless that one. And so he's always first. The only time that I know that he's not first is at the beginning of this thing where Joseph's like Manasseh and Ephraim. And then Jacob's like Ephraim and Manasseh. And from then on, because God has a way of accomplishing his ends that man doesn't. And it's counterintuitive and it's against nature. But God is supernatural and he is not bound by the same rules that you and I are. And his mind is better than yours. So I just ask you today to trust him. If he's calling you to do something, to trust him. See, I, I think we have a, a dearth of people going into ministry, or doing jobs like I'm doing right now, because we have people who are scared about the crossed hands of God. And they know they can make more money if they do anything else. And, I mean, if you're a faithful preacher, you'll probably make more money doing anything else. If you're a faithless preacher, you can make a ton of money, by the way private jets. Right? But if you're a faithful preacher, like, y'all are very generous with me, by the way. So, like, I'm, I'm not really down on my salary, so let's not go there. But, like, you're not making what you could be making out in the world. I've got a master's degree. Like, I'm sure I could sit at a desk somewhere and wiggle a mouse around and make six figures, right? That's what people do, apparently. I'm sure I could do that job. It doesn't seem that hard to move the mouse around. Right? But that's not, it's not what God wanted for me. For some of you, that's not what God wants for you. And for some of you, it's just you need to get off of this rat race. You need to get into this one that gives you more room for the other stuff God wants you to do. I don't know. 
I'm not the Holy Spirit. Please don't, don't hear me be the Holy Spirit in your life. But if God is talking to you, you dang well better listen to him. Because otherwise you'll live underneath the judgment, and I don't want you there. Mature faith recognizes, first of all, that there's promises that we may not receive. That we may not fully receive. That God, like will, will still accomplish them even if we don't see them. And we live in a knowledge of the future. Mature faith also realizes that God's ways are not our ways. And, not just recognizing that up here, but lives our lives according to God's counterintuitive ways. We don't seek power. Right? We don't seek wealth. We don't seek prestige. We seek to serve. Right, we're going to go out, we're going to serve hot dogs, snow cones to people living in the housing projects in Rockdale, Texas. The least powerful people in Rockdale, Texas. Why are we going there? Because they're people made in the image of God that God has told us to go and to serve. My God served. So I better join up and serve as well. It's what we do. Wouldn't it be better if we were serving people up on the hill, up by where I live? Right, they have money, they have power. City councilmen live up there. Who's the mayor right now? Did you say we've got a new mayor? Who was? Oh, huh? Oh, yeah, Ward lives up there. Yeah, the mayor's living up there now. Like, well, wouldn't it be better to, to get into the halls of power and go up on the hill up where I live and do something up there? Wouldn't that be a better use of our church's resources? No, it wouldn't. Now, it's not to say we shouldn't seek and serve those people, because absolutely we should. But, like, serve the least of these, because that's who Christ came to serve. So, guys, I'm going to ask you to, to grow in your faith today. You recognize when you hear these marks of a mature faith, say, I don't know if I have those yet. We'll begin to learn to trust the God who is consistent and faithful. I'm able to have faith in God because he's been faithful to me my whole life. And I made some really terrible, crazy, worldly decisions when I was 18 and 19 years old that worldly said should not work, and yet God has walked with me the whole way through. I wouldn't want it any other way. I wouldn't trade the, the wedding that I had 23 years ago for some new, fancier thing somewhere else with someone else. wouldn't trade the education that I got 24 years ago and things that I studied. Did it make sense? Not really. But it's where God wanted me to be. Are you where God wants you to be today? And if not, are you ready to trust the crossed hands of God and that he's still good, even in the midst of it? Let me pray.